from Washington, D.C. I'm Lauren Reese, and it's my privilege to welcome you to, the, to today's event on the status of one of the most stubborn challenges in human history, universal access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. For those of you joining a Wilson Center event for the first time, a special welcome and a quick word about where you're tuning into. The Wilson Center is the living memorial to President Wilson. We were mandated by Congress to connect policy, practice, and research through nonpartisan, independent analysis and open dialogue. Our program's expertise span every region of the world and today's most pressing issues. The program I direct, the Environmental Change and Security Program, connects issues at the intersection of environment, health, and security to foreign policy and development. The topic of today's discussion, water sanitation and hygiene, is as important an issue as it is complicated to address. But today, we're going to take the issue head on with a panel of experts who have dedicated their professional lives to navigating the complex challenges of meeting SDG 6, ensuring access to water and sanitation for all. Our opening speakers and panelists will help put into a broader context the groundbreaking reporting conducted by Circle of Blues' Keith Schneider in partnership with the Wilson Center and with the generous support of the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. I wanna thank our longtime friends and partners at Circle of Blue, Keith, Carl Ganter, Laura Hurd, and Connor Bebb for bringing their unique skill set of combining journalism, science, and data to this and so many projects we've done together. Adding gratitude too for data visualization support from Click and Deloitte. I'd also like to thank the Hilton Foundation for recognizing the need for and value of a project that shares stories that are so critical yet so often left untold. And I wanna thank my colleagues behind the scenes who make all things possible, my colleagues in ECSP, Amanda King and Ratia Tekinet, and our unmatched AV team without whom the Wilson Center would be unmoored. We have a great program today and a lot to fit into our two hours. We're gonna start with opening remarks by the Wilson Center's ambassador, Mark Green and USAID's Maura Berry before turning the floor over to Keith Schneider to provide some insights into his reporting. From there, we'll dig a bit deeper with our expert panel. I'm so pleased to introduce Wilson Center President and CEO, Ambassador Mark Green for opening remarks. Ambassador Green has dedicated much of his career to ensuring that the international development community has the tools, structures, and capacity to provide assistance that truly strengthens the resilience of communities. Previously, Ambassador Green served as Executive Director of the McCain Institute, Administrator of USAID, President of the International Republican Institute, and Senior Director at the US Global Leadership Coalition. Ambassador Green also served as the U.S. Ambassador to Tanzania and a member of Congress representing Wisconsin's 8th District. Over to you, Ambassador Green. Great. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, let me add my voice, welcoming everyone to the Wilson Center, where we tackle global issues through independent research, open dialogue, and actionable ideas. Uh, so for me, having the opportunity to open this important and timely discussion is really a very special moment. It's special for me because in my days at USAID, elevating water, sanitation, and hygiene work was a major part of our transformation of the agency, making sure that it was better integrated with our health and nutrition work. It's also special for me because of how I started my career in development. In the little Kenyan village where Sue and I taught, I can remember catching rainwater for cooking and bathing. I can remember classes being interrupted so students could go to the well or to the river when our pipe water systems broke down, which seemed to happen just about every week. And I remember contracting typhoid myself from contaminated water during my travels through the countryside. Achieving universal access to water, sanitation, and hygiene is one of humanitarian, uh, humanity's biggest aspirational goals. And with the support of the Hilton Foundation and in collaboration with our longtime trusted ally, Circle of Blue, we've had a rare opportunity to really dig into a sector which sadly receives so little popular attention. Globally, at least 2.2 billion people lack access to safe drinking water. Two billion people lack basic sanitation services and three billion still lack a basic hand washing facility at home, one that uses soap and water. Faced with those conditions, it's hard for people or communities to rise. But over the last 50 years, a dedicated network of government agencies, nonprofits, multilateral entities, private organizations, and academic institutions have invested more than $400 billion to improve wash services for countless people in need around the developing world. 
The title of today's event, Gleams with Optimism, tempered with the realization that there is so much work to be done. But we're making progress, unmistakable progress, and we have produced results, as you're about to hear. When COVID-19 took hold of the world last year, there were real concerns about the sustainability of financing and servicing of WASH, especially for those developing countries. Today, as COVID-19 continues to devastate communities around the world, taking st stock of where WASH systems are resilient to the pandemic can help provide some important insights for future investments and innovation, and I hope give shape to new partnerships. Reporting on the progress made, the challenges that remain, and impact of COVID-19 on the WASH sector is crucial. Our hope is that this project can help galvanize renewed energy and innovations in WASH to help us realize that goal of universal access. Today's event illustrates the significance of partnerships, trusted information, and solutions-focused dialogues to effectively respond to the world's most urgent challenges. I want to recognize my former USAID colleague, Maura Berry, for being here today. Thank you, Maura. Uh, and talking about the importance of water around the globe and the great work that USAID is doing. And I want to once again thank the Hilton Foundation for their generous support of this groundbreaking project and our friends at Circle of Blue for their many years of partnership with the Wilson Center. Back to you. Thank you, Ambassador Green. I'm delighted now to introduce Maura Berry. Ms. Berry serves as a Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and as USAID's Interim Global Water Coordinator. In this role, she oversees the implementation of the agency's responsibilities under the US Global Water Strategy. She also oversees the Bureau's strategy, program, budget, and administrative functions, which support implementation of both the Water for the World and Feed the Future initiatives. Maura has over has served overseas in East Africa, Afghanistan, and elsewhere for over 20 years. Most recently, she was a USAID mission director in Jamaica. Maura, over to you. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks for that introduction. And thank you, uh, Ambassador Green. You know, as you were speaking, and I've heard you speak many times about your how you started your career in East Africa, um, particularly as I've taken on the role of interim global water coordinator, I've been reflecting on where I started my career also in Western Kenya as a Peace Corps volunteer and, you know, was exposed really to how difficult it was to, to access water. Uh, same thing, collecting rainwater and seeing really how my neighbors struggled uh, on a daily basis to collect water. So I'm really pleased to be here and, and thank you, Lauren, for organizing this. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Green. And also, of course, thank you to um, our colleagues from Circle of uh, Blue, uh, as well as um, the Hilton Foundation. And, uh, you know, this series on the state of global drinking water, sanit water sanitation hygiene, what we all refer to as WASH, comes at such a historical moment where trends in the world we've seen altered so much by this global pandemic. They've stressed water services further than ever before. And it's at the same time we have a climate crisis and we have the hottest year on record. And I really commend the team at Circle of Blue and the Wilson Center for taking on a series of such an immense size. And also I wanna thank the organizations that are working on the ground for providing such candid insights into the state of global water and sanitation. And many of these local service providers and social enterprisers and the donors that were involved are, are partners of USAID. And um, you know, your perseverance and innovation, especially in this past year, are such an inspiration. And you know, the conclusion of the article series that was uh, the state of global wash sector is sort of like a glass that's half full, like my glass of water here. And we sell as we celebrate how far we've come. We also want to take a moment to focus on the work that we have ahead of us to fill that glass to the brim. I think we know in 2016, the global community set an ambitious but necessary bar for the sustainable development goals. When we look at goal six, water sanitation and hygiene access for all, we know that in the past 20 years, we have made some incremental progress for billions of people 
around the world with at least basic access to a communal drinking water point that's available year round and is within a reasonable distance from their homes, you know, such as a hand pump or a kiosk, and also to a lesser extent, um, some improvements have been made on basic sanitation access. And we know that basic sanitation is defined as a toilet that is used by only one household or a latrine. The latest global monitoring data from the UN tells us that universal access to safe and equitable drinking water, sanitation and hygiene is perhaps within sight, but of course it's far from being reached yet. With regards to drinking water, at the current rate of change, the UN estimates that 60% of countries and territories are going to miss the target of universal access to water in 2030. And even for the most basic level of drinking water services. And while many of those countries are in sub-Saharan Africa, it also includes countries such as Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Haiti, Malaysia, Nepal, Nicaragua, Pakistan, we know that those countries will also be home to millions of people without even basic water access. And in terms of sanitation, we face even more difficult path to achieving universal access to sanitation. The current estimates tell us that by 2040, 10 years after the SDG deadline, we're still going to have more than 100 countries that haven't yet reached universal access to basic sanitation. And as many as 750 million people likely still won't have access to a decent toilet, one that they don't have to share with others outside of their house, and one that is durable. And when it comes to hygiene, prior to the global pandemic, some 3 billion people lacked a place to wash their hands. And then during the pandemic, all of a sudden, the whole world was paying attention to hand washing. And it started, you know, really to grab attention. But now, we see that research uh, and evidence is suggesting that the heightened awareness is starting to taper off. And that leaves us with a really daunting challenge. The best data available suggests that we are well, unfortunately off track for meeting the SDGs, even if we continue to make progress at the rate we have. And this comes at a time of mounting challenges. The COVID pandemic has increased cost and reduced revenue for service providers, and it's really shown the weakness and vulnerabilities uh, of the WASH systems. And the ongoing climate crisis is only going to increase the challenges that the entire global community will face. And we know, right, that 90% of disasters arising from climate change are related to water, like drought, flood, water contamination. All of these factors, they may make it tempting for us to sort of water down our goals, so to speak, but setting Settling for basic wash access is, is not good enough for billions of people around the world who lack free water that's free from contamination that is within reach and hygienic sanitation services that safeguard human health and that advance dignity and protect the environment. So we need to work together to build on incremental progress made on basic water and sanitation and bend the curve, bend it way, way up towards a higher level of safe and equitable access for all and ensure that water resources are sustainable. I think the good news is that if we, if we can close the gap from basic access to safe universal access, then we can attain the greatest returns for human health, for job creation, economic growth, for women's empowerment, and for tackling the climate crisis. Um, I'd like to share an example from a recent study by Stanford University in rural Zambia, where they found that the greatest benefits of water access on women's empowerment and productivity came from a pipe service that reached their home. And the study stated that switching from a village borehole to pipe supply saved almost 200 hours of fetching time per year for a typical household. A task that I think everyone participating today knows disproportionately falls upon women and girls. And this improved productivity is one of many examples of why piped water and safely managed wash services really must continue to be our goal. And getting to this goal will require a doubling down on a systems approach to wash. So as documented in the Circle of Blue series, a new blueprint for universal access has really started to emerge among governments and donors and in civil society and service providers alike. And also, uh, the approach 
this approach is, is really at the heart of USAID's Water for the World programs. And this blueprint approach is a holistic systems approach to WASH. It combines investments in infrastructure with improved service delivery and accountable governance. This system puts serving the needs of people that we ultimately aim to help at the heart of its efforts. And the general approach reduces risks and increases the rewards from universal uh, wash access and potentially attracts greater attention by both by governments and investors alike. So I'm really pleased to see that the Circle of Blue series spotlights promising and innovative approaches from organizations like Sanergy and Fundifix and Uptime and IRC. These are all uh, groups that USAID has had the, the privilege to partner with, um, as well as uh, the World Bank. Uh, Joel, it's great to, great to see you here today. Um, so with all of that said, it's important to remember that systems, of course, we know can look different uh, country to country or across urban to rural settings. But the standout examples in the Circle of Blue series share some common features of high performing WASH systems. And that includes working with a strong sector governance framework with clear goals um, and incentives and coordinating among key actors. And so we're gonna hear more from the panelists about uh, best practices. And I know that of course will include a focus on government accountability at all levels, uh, investing in programs at scale uh, and identifying innovative and sustainable finance. So uh, I just highlight a few of the things I think we'll hear more about. So while the pioneers profiled in this series and here on the event panel have made significant contributions in advancing the art of what is possible, significantly more work is needed to bring these types of approaches to scale and really to be truly transformative Investment, innovation, and continued commitment to tackling the thorniest challenges in wash service delivery certainly will be needed. And so we've learned so much in the past 40 years uh, since the first decade of water, probably close to the time that at least myself started in Peace Corps almost 40 years ago. Um, we've really seen an era that was from moving from an era on wash that was focused on small scale infrastructure such as pit latrines for sanitation and tippy taps for hand washing, we've seen that grown uh, to be much wiser uh, where we now have a wash sector that looks to take collective action with local service providers and governments. It is more data and evidence driven than ever before and understands that universal access is more than just toilets, taps and, and hand pumps. The wash sector is really poised to step up and contribute to the economic recovery and building back better from COVID, the COVID pandemic, and also preparing for the next global health emergency when and, and wherever that may emerge. And so going forward, uh, wash, a WASH systems approach will also need to take into account the growing competition for water resources among different stakeholders, of course, across borders, and also will need to mainstream climate adaptation and mitigation into service delivery efforts. And the first step is to include and elevate water resources in WASH in national climate plans and commitments. And so with that, I, I wanna thank the Circle of Blue and the Wilson Center for bringing us together this morning um, to help us celebrate some of the bright spots uh, and talk about, uh, particularly in the challenges of the past year and talk about uh, a way forward. So I wanna encourage us all to keep in mind that glass, right? That's half full and how we're gonna to work together to, to get it filled up to the brim. So I wish you all a fantastic panel and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. So back to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Maura. I think you laid a perfect foundation for this discussion, um, laying out some of you know how there's been a blueprint that's been developed over the last decade for a, a, a more resilient way forward perhaps, um, but that, that the challenges are stark um, and require uh, continued and elevated effort. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel now, um, and then from there we're going to go to Keith for a quick overview of the, the series itself, um, and then we'll go to the panel for, for some deep dives into some of the issues that Maura so eloquently laid out. Um, 
let's see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce everybody in, in alphabetical order, starting with Sheila Kibutu, who's joining us from Kenya. Sheila is in charge of building and managing relationships with Sanergy's external stakeholders, including government, partners, and media. She's an experienced strategic and digital communications expert and impact storytelling and advocacy expert. We have Joel Kolker, who's the program manager of the World Bank's Global Water Practices Think Tank, Global Water Security and Sanitation Partnership, which supports analytical work and knowledge across the entire water sector, including work on water, sanitation and hygiene, water resource management, water and agriculture, and water storage. He previously coordinated the World Bank's Water Practices Global Effort to secure additional financing to meet the financing gap in the sector. Joel brings 35 years of experience in dealing with a host of issues related to infrastructure finance across multiple sectors and has lived, worked, and led projects in over 30 countries, primarily in Africa and Asia. Dr. Duncan McNichol is the director and co-founder of Uptime, an international consortium developing a multi-country performance-based funding mechanism for rural water maintenance services. He has WASH experience in Africa, Asia, and South America, where he has directed governance programs, managed professional rural water maintenance services, and led academic research. Duncan is joining us today from Tanzania. Dr. Tanvi Nag Nagpal is the director of the International Development Program at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Tanvi's career, span, career spans work at the World Bank, NGOs, and academic institutions. Her research and policy work have focused on sustainable and equitable water, sanitation, and solid waste de service delivery, supporting communities and local governments to manage environmental resources, and generating financial support for pro-poor urban policies and programs. And finally, Keith Schneider is the senior editor and chief correspondent at Circle of Blue, where he has reported on the intensifying confrontation between water, food, and energy from six continents. He was a national correspondent for the New York Times for over a decade and continues to report as a special writer on diverse range of topics for the Times. Keith is an award-winning journalist, online communication specialist, and environmental policy expert who provides important insights on global trends in energy, water, and food, and on the role of original reporting and online communications in the public interest. So we've got a really um, amazing expert panel and a lot of expert communicators. So it's a it's high bar <laughs> for, the, 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 for the discussion today. Um, a quick note that we will reserve the last 15 minutes or so for Q&A. So please feel free to email, email your questions at any point in the discussion to ecsp at wilsoncenter.org. Again, that's ecsp at wilsoncenter.org. Please indicate your name, title, and affiliation with your submitted question. The email is also listed below uh, the video where you're watching this discussion. Um, Keith, I'm going to hand it over to you. Hey, <clears throat> thank you. Really nice to be here. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be part of this project. Um, we had a lot of thank yous, so I want to add one, two more. One is to the Foundation Hilton Foundation for making this possible. And the second is to all the sources, all the sources, some of whom, many, all of whom are on this, on this uh, call for providing the time and the expertise and the guidance to understand that. And I say that because all projects are an adventure, but when you tackle a project this big and this sweeping with the magnitude of what we're talking about, WASH globally, that's a big project. And I really didn't understand it. Um, when Carl came to me in December and said, you wanna tackle this, you wanna look at what the effect of COVID-19 has been on WASH. And I remind you that Carl and I have been all over the world for the last over a decade reporting on various and sundry parts of, of water and energy and food. And we've tackled WASH locally. You know, we've been to Durban. We've been to the informal settlements in Durban. We've been to China's informal settlements. We've been to Delhi's slums and, and many others in India. And, and we've been to Peru and we, we've done work on the settlements in Peru. Um, but I had no idea about WASH. I, I didn't know anything about this amazing, enormous uh, global international campaign that has been going on for over 50 years to achieve one of the great humanitarian successes, to really go out and help people in a way that many other international campaigns haven't. And I didn't understand it until I've been involved internationally and talked to Tanvi, who's on this call, um, to help me kind of understand the sweep of it. And I reported back to our project, uh, Lauren and Amanda and our own staff. And I said, look, COVID-19 is an issue in WASH. It's an issue everywhere. 
But it's not nearly the impediment, in my view, at this point, that what Wash has been dealing with for 50 years, which is, you know, the uh, population in cities is growing, uh, poverty in rural areas, uh, uh, unsanitary conditions, uh, sanit uh, uh, providing water under very difficult circumstances, financing and funding. Uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 piece uh, looked to me to be, you know, a subset of that. It was, it was an, an issue, but not nearly the issues that the other things that I, I just tripped over. We agreed that, yeah, we should, we should try to restructure re, re, uh, this project, restructure the narrative. And I suggested doing three things. I suggested one, to look at services. I mean, let's assess services. Two, to look at financing, which is which is a lot of new things are happening in financing, successful things happening in finance. And three, to look at infrastructure. And we agreed, let's okay do that. But you know, put wrap the COVID nineteen story within all of that. Um, so uh, let's talk about what I found because uh, it was an adventure of discovery. First thing that I found was that that this campaign involves some of the most high profile institutions on the planet, the World Bank, the United Nations, UNICEF, WHO, uh, Oxford University, uh, the Gates Foundation, uh, you know, USAID, that, that some of the most prominent, successful, durable, stable institutions in the planet are involved and have been involved for decades. Two, that this was a galaxy. That, that you had some big players and you had some middle players and you had a lot of people on the ground. And of course I found Sanergy and, and, and Sheila spent a lot of time on the phone with me explaining what was happening at Sanergy. I found Funded Fix and, and at Cliff Nyagi spent a lot of time on the phone at odd hours of the day explaining uh, uh, what was happening with rural water supply. And of course, Duncan helped me understand what was happening in uptime. The second thing that I found is that there's a, been a lot of money a lot of money spent over the last 50 years on this. And I was able to kind of document that at least $400 billion, this is constant dollars, has been spent on Washington in the 2020s. I mean, in the 2015s from 20, 2015 to 2020, about $20 billion a year, maybe a little bit more of that. Now, the best database on this is OECED's ba da database. But there are other little databases around that I was able to trip over and put together that, that, um, that, that estimated uh, value uh, funding in this sector. The third thing I, I found was that was that there's this conversation about whether Wash is successful or unsuccessful. That that what I found was that Wash has been a whole lot more successful than the than the than the key players have acknowledged over the last twenty or thirty years. And and I also found that the UN was the most critical, the most pessimistic uh, institution about WASH's success. And in fact, four days before uh, World Water Day this year, Balkan Bozkir, I hope I'm spelling, uh, pronouncing his name right. Four days before Water Day, he said, the fact is that we are nowhere near achieving the goals that we have set out for WASH. And I don't think that's accurate. In fact, I think, I think it's wrong. And it's wrong for a number of reasons that, that uh, more of us already said. I mean, glass half full, glass half empty. I saw a glass more half full than half empty. In fact, there are 5 billion people on the planet who have, have been able to gain access to safely managed and improved sanitation. There are billions that haven't gained access, don't have access, but there are five, more than 5 billion that have gained access. And that is the result of the kinds of work that's been going on in this sector. Um, the UN says that now says that 673 million people practice open defecation. Well, that's half the number that practiced open defecation, you know, at the start of the, at the start of the century. And I think that that this um, tension between whether the sector is successful or unsuccessful may be a marketing piece in order to encourage more funding and more attention to it. But I think that the sector is achieving the kinds of success that hasn't been recognized to date. Um, the other thing, the other thing is, is I discovered a community of really devoted professionals, some of whom are on this call. And, and Joel and I had this conversation about whether we were successful or unsuccessful. And I said to Joel, recall what you were dealing with when you started your career in the 80s and what's happened 
and changed since then. And, and so I, I've been impressed, so impressed by the people that I've met online and on Zoom, by the devotion, by the fact that they're involved for much of their careers because they see change is occurring, progress is being made, significant progress is being made um, on, a, on an activity, on a campaign that has real human merit. And the last piece of this is that I had this really interesting conversation with Steph Smith at IRC and I asked him, oh, look, my assessment is that, that WASH is a lot closer to its achieving its goals than what the sector says it is achieving. What do you think? And he told me, he said to me that, and I'm gonna quote him here. He said to me, in universal access reaching 100% for water and sanitation achievable by 2030, he said, I think in 95% of the world, that is more or less achievable. And if you look at what's happening in Vietnam, places like Bolivia, places like Peru, that's, that's clearly the case. The other piece of this is the UN data is, is uh, four years old. So the data base is not as, as, as uh, current as it, I think it needs to be. Um, and he said that based on linear projections and the data that we know, that is achievable. And the, and the last frontier is Africa and people involved in this, in this sector know it's Africa. And he said to me, with Africa, it probably, we could probably achieve it by 2040, universal access in Africa. So I, my assessment as a journalist coming at this completely fresh, not knowing the scale, size, importance of it, is that 2040 is an achievable goal in Africa for universal access. And thanks a lot, a lot to the Hilton Foundation on I hope that you will let us continue this reporting. Thank you, Keith. That's great. Uh, I love the way that you out find that in terms of the numbers and everything, but just the, the themes across the wash sector that you see as you know a, an outsider, so to speak. Um, I think that's a really uh, interesting way to reflect on the sector as a whole, and I hope that we can do that in this discussion. Um, Tanvi, I'd like to, to start with you um, as somebody who's dedicated much of your professional life to better understanding and improving service delivery in developing countries. You know, I think all of the speakers we've heard from this morning have underscored just how complicated universal access to WASH is to achieve. And Keith's reporting does highlight stories of success led by social enterprises like Sanergy and Uptime. And we'll hear from uh, Duncan and Sheila on how they've, they've managed to achieve those successes. But we all know that, that the scale of the problem goes beyond what any single social enterprise can achieve. So can you uh, talk a little bit about, from your perspective, what else is needed as we take forward the next 10 to 20 years? Um, thank you, Lauren. And thank you, Keith. I am so grateful to be here today with um, this incredible group of people who um, have dedicated their lives and to, to really to wash and some aspect of wash. Um, so to go back, uh, thank you, Keith, for also sort of presenting the good and the bad, both um, in a very measured way. Um, I, I really think that we've come a long way since that first few, since those first few conversations that you and I had. So just going back to Lauren's um, question, the first thing I say, the stronger of services in is really economic growth, it's income. And so really, whether we look at it in the poorest countries in the world or in the richest countries in the world, uh, the economic growth and its distribution are really, really key to the presence of service delivery, right? So you want to make sure that it's universal, which means that the hardest to reach and the poorest are also receiving services and not just the wealthiest. Um, and that's very important. And that's true for all kinds of services, whether that's health or education or wash, income and, equal and, and equity in service delivery are really good, um, are really related in a way. And, and the heart of that is governments and governance. Um, and it's the governments who have to adopt the policies, to commit very scarce, often fun, you know, fungible resources, um, to multiple and competing priorities. And in developing countries, that's really, really becomes difficult because education is important and health is important and wash is important. And as, as our energy and transport and lots and lots of public services. Um, 
so I think it's important for us to go back to sort of what is going to allow these really, really incredible social enterprises, Uptime, Sanergy, uh, Fundifix, all of them, what is going to allow them to be um, integrated into the entire system, the ethos of service delivery. What these incredible social enterprises have done is to develop models that are financially, environmentally sustainable. They've shown us ways in which you can reach the hardest to reach, whether they are in urban slums or in remote rural areas. But in order for those models, those methods, those strategies to really have an impact, they will have to be integrated somehow into service delivery systems that are managed by governments. And so I think probably the next frontier is trying to figure out how we make that happen. Um, and, and you know that's what I would sort of leave it. Of course, there's a million other things that have to happen, but in order to get us started, I thought I'd say that. Thank you, Tanvi. It's a very good point. Uh, Duncan, I'm gonna come to you now. I th you know, Tanvi brings up this important point about being able to integrate service delivery into, um, into the management of governments, frankly, or government management. Um, in Keith's reporting, he shared Uptime's approach to increase funding to operate and maintain, maintain services through results-based contracts. You've had some impressive results from the approach, but at a small scale relative to broader WASH needs. Can you give us a quick 101 on your approach and how you see this potential to scale up the approach? And, and does that include working more closely with governments um, and integrating your approach into these broader service delivery um, goals? Great, thanks very much. And uh, a real pleasure to be here today. Thanks for having me. Um, so we, uh, the first thing I wanna pick up on was something that Ambassador Green mentioned in his opening remarks, just to talk about the specific uh, subset of the wash sector that Uptime is looking at. He talked about uh, when the pipe scheme would break down and what a problem that is. And that's very much the problem that Uptime is focused on. It's in the rural areas, it's the maintenance, the reliability of these infrastructures. So not just is there access, but does that service work reliably? And then from the, you know, can it, can it be sustainable so that we're really leaving no one behind uh, in, in even rural and remote areas? And, and so the way we did that, uh, Uptime is actually a working group. We, uh, two years ago, we convened five service providers and Oxford University to share data. And the original goal was to develop an investment case to say, can we aggregate operational and financial data in a way that makes the performance apparent that could attract blended finance or something like that, uh, basically to resolve some of these uh, information asymmetries around rural spaces to try and unlock funding. And, uh, and so we were able to do that to some extent. We were able to aggregate certain operational and financial uh, indicators of these services from a number of different countries and contexts and service models. And what we found is that by and large, these five organizations, they're doing, they're delivering a really high level of service reliability. Uh, users are paying some, but not all of the costs. And in most areas, actually many of these services still require a subsidy to continue operating. And, and so we had to kind of reconsider how we were approaching this based on what, what the data were telling us. And, and look at, you know, if the goal is, uh, if the SDG is universal services, then we expect, as, as Tampi was alluding to, there's, there's segments in the, in the wash sector. There's, you know, some areas you have higher uh, population density, more mature institutions, higher level of income, and so forth, that, uh, that, you know, all sort of work in the favor of a service being able to be financially sustainable. As, as we get out to universal services, you know, where we're really leaving no one behind, then what we're seeing is there are some areas where, you know, the services aren't as developed, the institutions aren't as developed, maybe there's a uh, sparser population, higher supply chain costs and so on. And, and so these areas still need some sort of non-repayable funding in order to, to continue uh, delivering that service and developing it. And, and so we said, okay, well, if, those, if that's what the data are, how do we meet that challenge? And, and what we asked was, how might we develop a funding mechanism that is targeted, transparent, data-driven, and ultimately scalable, so this can 
try and solve the problem at the level of the SDG and, and do so in a way that allows the service to continue while also motivating uh, higher levels of financial and operational performance over time. So how do we motivate these services to get better? And what we did uh, last year was we developed a results-based contract design. So we looked at three key performance metrics uh, based on the reliability of infrastructure, the volume of water produced, and the amount of revenue generated. And then we use that to design a results-based contract. So the idea is the service providers do the work based on their performance, then they would be eligible for a non-repayable grant uh, based on what they And uh, over the past year, what we've done is uh, put this into practice. Uh, so late last year, we established the Uptime Catalyst Facility as a UK charity, as the funding vehicle. We raised approximately a million dollars in uh, in grant funding from you know, known WASH philanthropies and, and foundations to test this model. And uh, I'm delighted to announce that this week uh, we're actually releasing the first results-based payment. Um, this week it's up to Kenya and Central African Republic uh, on aggregate. These are services delivered in quarter four 2020 that we're paying for. Services uh, supporting uh, about 1.3 million people, we estimate, in four countries at a cost of about $215,000. And, and what we're able to do and what we're you know, working through is you know, how do we create this really transparent targeted link between resources and results uh, in a way that's also generating the data that could eventually allow you know, governments or, or others to adopt these approaches. Uh, we can move away from the sort of you know, ideological stance of you know, people should pay for water, they shouldn't, or, or, or you know, other such debates and say, well, here's the reality on the ground, here's the data to back it up. And, uh, and here's a model that, that we're testing that can show how this, um, how this could function in practice, um, even at a multi-country level. So a, a single contract design that could accommodate different contexts and, and services in countries. Thank you, Duncan. Sheila, can you uh, talk to us about Sanergy? So this is a 12-year-old company that manages 3,500 public toilets used by more than 130,000 people a day in Nairobi. Uh, you know, we see all over the world that cities are growing at a faster rate than governments are able to provide essential services, uh, including water and sanitation. So you're working in this complex environment. Can you talk us uh, talk to us about the challenges that you that that Sanergy is working to address, and and what how you let's see um, how you've applied sort of a unique a unique way forward in this complex environment. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much, Lorraine, um, for having us. Um, and I'm really excited to speak to you about Sanergy and what we do. So as you've mentioned, uh, cities are really, really growing. And so what Sanergy is doing is really providing inclusive sanitation to everyone in, in those growing cities. Um, and as you've mentioned, so seeing that these cities are growing, especially like in Kenya, where 10 million people live in, in slums today, um, we are trying to build a, a solution um, to be able to provide inclusive sanitation for everyone. And so we're really looking at three key challenges that um, these cities are facing to be able to provide sanitation to everyone. And we are seeing the issue of time. Cities are really growing beyond what um, beyond the infrastructure that is available. We are also seeing that um, the space is not there as cities grow and especially in slums, we are seeing that the spaces are really packed. Um, and so the population is growing, we have uh, less and less space to work with. And so trying to address this challenge um, through innovative solution, solutions. The other thing is that we are seeing a massive, um, as cities grow and as the population grows, we are also seeing a massive challenge with waste. So trying to also look at how do we, um, address the problem of, of waste and sanitation waste is a big part of that waste that is you know polluting the environment today and also impacting on um on, on the on health and economic uh, development of cities and i really liked what uh, Maura was saying that we are not just looking to provide basic services uh, to people but we are looking to provide safe and universal services to everyone so sanergy is exactly trying to do that making sure that we are providing safe and sustainable um, sanitation for everyone particularly those um, living in informal settlements where you know access is, is barely there and so we have built uh, our model um, 
in what we call a circular economy approach. We are using what we call a circular economy approach, and that is built on three key uh, pillars, which is uh, build, collect, and convert. So operationally trying to, to build uh, sanitation products and services that fit the hardest to reach of places. Uh, informal settlements, you know, they are packed. Um, informal settlements also, they are informal for a reason, like they're called informal for a reason, meaning that, you know, families might remain there temporarily and then leave, but that's not the case with the current, you know, growth in um, population. So we are trying to build, you know, solutions that will last, that will be sustainable for people and will be feasible for people and are flexible to be able to amend. So um, that is why we have come up, we, we, we provide what we call a container-based um, toilets. And so these toilets are waterless, um, first be able to then, you know, save on water um, and they are very compact to be able to save on space. Um, and at the same time, you know, um, they, they are easy to build. So we use what we call a human centered approach where we, pre where, where we have, you know, all um, the, the community is, is our main customer. And so we get their feedback and we are able to, you know, build um, what they want and then um, prefabricate it at our factory and then install it. So taking a minimum of one to three days to be able to install to to be able to install that um, toilet to make sure that everyone has then access to to sanitation. The other big problem um, we are trying to address is um, the waste problem. How do we then be able to how do we um, remove all of this waste safety, safely and professionally? So we are we we have we have created a, a network of um, you know logistics personnel, um, and these people are really just from the community who safely and professionally remove all of this waste from these communities and track it out uh, from, the com from, from those communities, um, leaving people you know, healthy and, um, and, and, and the environment quite clean. So the other one is um, we, we convert all of this waste. So we, because um, the problem uh, with, with the waste, especially in cities, is that we are still using a lot of you know, antiquated um, strategies to manage our waste. If it's organic waste, it's ending up in landfills, you know, polluting our environment. And sanitation waste um, in informal settlements, we are seeing a lot of, you know, pit latrines be being used. Um, and so where does that waste go to? So what Sanergy is doing is being able to then um, repurpose all of this waste and make sure that we are we are creating value from that waste and, and, may, and manufacturing, you know, quality and valuable products that then come back to the to the community to address other challenges that, such as you know food security so yeah so that is it about um our, our operations and then when it comes to you know building partnerships on the other on the other spectrum is that you know building our model from the ground up looking at you know the communities that we serve and making sure that you know we they are our main customers and also looking working with government so that we are creating uh services and products that that are sustainable and will you know serve the communities in the in the long run um, so with government also working with them at every level, um, building, you know, working towards improving on policies, um, especially that then, you know, look at the container based um, sanitation, which is a, 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 a unique, you know, um, sanitation model. And so just looking at the spectrum of, build, uh, of creating that enabling environment um, for such a solution to be able to, you know, succeed in that, uh, in the context of informal settlements and scale beyond, you know, for example, Nairobi, where we are, Nairobi and Kisumu, where we are currently operating. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. It's really a fascinating approach and the, um, the, the development of, of the model with a circular economy approach is really um, sort of inspiring, frankly. Can you, real quick, can you give us an example of, so you take the waste out and you convert it into mm -hmm. products that can go back in, you said for food security. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Yeah, sure. So what happens is that once we have tracked out all of this waste uh, from the communities, we have then built a big factory 
which, which we call an organics recycling factory. So we collect two main streams of waste. Um, and this is sanitation waste from, uh, from the toilets that we have installed in the informal settlements. And we also collect other organic waste from cities, um, you know, marketplaces, agricultural park houses, restaurants. Uh, we collect all of this waste and then we we have it, you know, tracked out and taken to that factory. And at that factory, we rear what we call a, a fly, a unique fly called a black soldier fly. And this black soldier fly is a really good um, waste converter. It converts waste uh, very safely and effectively, and it breaks it down into, you know, high protein and uh, and residue. So the protein component is what we again we 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 package and we create what we call um, a protein for a high quality protein for animal feed. And this can be fed to chicken, pig and fish. Um, then the, uh, the, the waste that they produce, which is a residue, is what we further decompose um, to be able to make uh, organic fertilizer and, 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 um, and uh, biomass briquettes. So the organic fertilizer, again, um, really works well with our farmers to be able to, you know, address uh, soil fertility challenges that a lot of our farmers are facing today. And at the same time, you know, food security, just increasing uh, farmers' yields and incomes. Um, at the same time, you know, in Kenya, we have a ban on, um, on the use of charcoal for environmental reasons. And so what we are now producing is a um, eco-friendly biomass briquettes and these briquettes are an alternative you know to um to charcoal and now this can be used you know uh, i mean at industrial levels to, uh, to provide a clean source of energy and and that way we are being we are able to create you know climate resilient and sustainable cities um all together that's great thank you sheila uh joel let's go back to this issue of financing uh so what are we missing? Keith's reporting highlighted that current annual spending on WASH is 20 billion, but to actually achieve SDG six by 2030, the amount needs to be closer to 114 billion a year. So I'd love to hear from you as somebody who's been working in this area for decades. What do you think is need that? What do you think needs to be done to to close this gap? Well, thanks, Lauren. Thanks to Circle of Blue and Hilton and Wilson Center for inviting us today. Look, I think it comes down pretty basically to two foundational issues. I think the service providers, whether local government utilities or uh, other institutions that are providing watch services, need to be technically and financially efficient. So what does that mean? In our sector, we're blessed with key performance indicators. We know quality issues are there. Uh, we know that if your non-revenue water is 40%, you can't be efficient. We know if your collection rates on existing tariffs are 60%, you can't be efficient. So uh, we have to get back to our, our basics in terms of running uh, efficient, uh, technically competent operations providing water and sanitation services. And that's the first of two foundational issues. Second is a little harder. It's about the policy, governance, institutional, and regulatory arrangements, kind of the, the systems approach that Tanvi was referring to. And this is hard. This is not just about tariffs. It's about subsidies. It's about the institutional arrangements. Who owns the service provider? How is it managed? What are the governance arrangements? How does it operate in the broader perspective? And that's been a much more difficult challenge than the operational efficiency. And it's compounded by, in many places, integrity issues. You know, we have situations where we spent decades creating water laws and regulatory environments and around elections or other things that are undermined. Um, and we have to maintain the integrity. So with both of those foundational issues in place, we can really start talking about getting more efficient and ultimately around this term of creditworthiness. Now, it's not necessarily creditworthiness to go to the markets and raise money, which would be great. And we do that in most mature markets. People don't expect to pay for infrastructure that's gonna be in place for you know 100 years uh, with operating expense right away. So going to the markets is fairly common and efficient, but we can't do any of that if these two foundational points are made. And that's really at the center on how to overcome this. I think what COVID taught us is getting to this operational efficiency is not just important for private resources, 
but also for the public resources. We saw massive mobilization of funds going into the health sector. And yet we knew water was the other key component in combating the pandemic at the beginning of it. And we saw real challenges in water service providers um, in terms of their revenue loss initially and their expenses going up. And we've normalized that from what we can tell, but we still remain very vulnerable. So to conclude on this point, I think it's really central to get back to the basics. Don't worry about the supply of money. We can talk about bonds or microfinance or other instruments, but our service providers need to get more technically and financially efficient. And our oversight and the transparency around the operating environment, the governance, the policies and the regulations really needs to become more, um, more efficient in how we govern the sector. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. I'm sure you have some suggestions as to how we can do that. Sure. Do you want to take a minute to talk about? Sure, okay. sure. Look, we have a um, we have a large portfolio. Obviously, you know, the bank has about forty billion dollars invested in water. Uh, about two thirds of that is in the water practice. But just showing how big this sector is and how interconnected it is, we have investments in agriculture, urban energy, which all directly impact on the water sector. But to get back to your point, I really think we have, a, um, we have several tools specifically that are available for service providers to get more efficient. This notion of these key performance indicators help us target where we really need to look and what we know. And as I mentioned, things like non-revenue water, the number of employees, um, collection rates, those are all very fundamental and very foundational. And you can, we run a database, which we're updating now, about 5,000 utilities around the world. We're hoping to make it bigger and better. Um, but it really looks at those benchmarks. And then based on that, we hope to really get to the kinds of solutions. We're running a program called Utilities of the Future, which really looks at the basics on how to improve your efficiency. And we have another program around the policy, institutional, and regulatory environment to help um, get to those kind of administrative or systematic issues that Tom mentioned. Now, what makes us a bit unusual is that we're able to combine that analytical work and do buy-in through our lending operations. So those lending operations can be directly for infrastructure investment with that kind of support and on the sustainability issue in particular. But we can also do it through um, through our dial our policy dialogues with the Ministry of Finance. And let's face it, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where the money is, and we have to get more efficient in the operations to secure that. So yeah, there are plenty of tools out there on how to uh, how to improve our efficiency and how to improve our governance arrangements. We just need the political leadership to really get there, and we are in certain countries but uh, it remains a challenge in other places. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Joel. Um, we do have some questions coming in, but I'm gonna hold off on those for just a minute. Um, I, I think that one of the key themes that, that spoke to me from Keith's reporting is that there has been this great progress in the wash sector. Um, it is a sector that can sometimes be really hard on itself. And the, the challenge is, immense. And so it's understandable how it can be daunting. But I think that, um, you know, Keith's reporting and, and just even hearing from all of you today, there has been a lot of lessons learned and those are being applied very strategically. So I, I'd like to go back to each of you and ask how you think the sector needs can build on that progress moving forward. And actually, Keith, I'm going to start with you. Um, just given your perspective from your months of reporting and the conversations you've had with over 40 experts in this field, um, it'd be interesting to hear from you what what are those like sort of nodes of progress that need to be built on moving forward? You're muted. Sorry about that. I say more people know in the particulars and the details, what needs to be done for the wash sector, clearly scaling up the kinds of things that Sanergy and Fundifix and Uptime are doing is important. Having governor, governments uh, embrace 
the necessity and the value of this from a human perspective and an economic perspective and a, a social well-being perspective. I want to talk about my area of expertise, which is reporting and journalism and communications. Now, I have a lot of expertise in covering water and energy. And because of my reporting and other reporting, both of those sectors have gained great prominence, particularly the energy sector globally. We know a lot about what's happening. Just popular journalism takes it on. And I think that that communications has been a factor in advancing sort of the renewable clean energy idea and expanding it. I mean, it's got a lot of finance, it's got a lot of you know, climate pieces, but I think communicating about it and understanding what's happening country by country and sector by sector has been important. The wash sector to me is, is like the shipping sector. We, popular journalism doesn't cover the shipping sector, which is one of the biggest industries and the most important industries in the world, as we learned when one ship got stuck in the Suez Canal and the whole world you know, sort of paid attention. Well, the wash sector is kind of like that, not as big as the shipping sector, but you know, the wash sector will uh, attain that kind of global prominence when something terrible happens, like uh, arsenic in the Bangladesh uh, groundwater situation of the 1990s. I think the sector needs more reporting, more attention. I think that there are some great uh, human interest stories and great personalities, great figures. I mean, the Sanergy story itself is just an amazing story of, of progress and, and, and personality and, and, uh, and, and compelling drama and narrative. And that's my piece. I, I, think, I think journalism, we, we, we need more journalists covering this and man, I would love to lead the pack. I think that we can do that kind of work to, to help elevate what is this progress? It is progressing. I mean, why did Southeast Asia, Vietnam in particular, go from 50% basic water to 84%? I mean, how did that happen in 17 years? How's it happened in Peru? That's an amazing story. And, and those are the kinds of stories that I think we should tell within this sector. I think that communications and journalism will really help. Well. Uh, sitting at the Wilson Center, I fully agree with that. It is all about how you tell that story and who you're telling it to and um, the story that you're telling itself. Uh, let's see, why don't we go to Tanvi next? Um, thinking about how to build on the progress that's been made. Um, so Joel has essentially said everything that I always say and um, you know the others have illustrated it. And I think it it goes to show you that we're, we've all been working on these same issues and have come to in the sector quite a joint common understanding that we can now complete each other's thoughts and sentences quite quite, quite often, you know. Um, but what I'd like to highlight today, in addition to all these great points my colleagues have made, is that for a long time now, the wash sector, at least as far as long as I've been in it, has been talking about the need for cross-sectoral partnerships, um, which we talk about a lot but it doesn't actually translate into real actual partnerships. Um, and we don't know how to build them. We don't know how to make them intentional. We don't know how to make them sort of mutually beneficial. You know, um, if we are really going to be able to speak to governments um, about impacting their broader governance priorities, how to really target their investments so that they're most efficiently made because there, there are scarce resources. We have to be able to talk about intersectionality. How does water and agriculture, how does water and power, how does water and health work together, right? Um, and I work a lot with health colleagues and I think there's, um, among them, there's still sort of this feeling that uh, oh, the, the water people, they're all engineers. They know how to build pipes. We don't know anything about that. And, you know, uh, and, and the water people are now terrified about doing yet another study that shows, oh, just improving water is not gonna improve health outcomes. There's just been too many of those. But everybody in the health sector and the water sector understands that water is a component of nutrition. Water is a really important input into health. Water is a really, it's about dignity, it's about safety. It's just about, you know, so it, the, the fact that we talk about this, but we really, when we sit down together and we look around the room, it's all wash people, you know? Um, it's, it's not wash, it's not everybody who's sector. And, and I'm not saying that every avenue and every meeting and every program has to be about all these things, but I do think that we have to become 
much more intentional and much smarter about when we talk about partnerships that are mutually beneficial. And we, I don't think we've done that very well. Have you seen it done well, Tanvi? Um, Not to put you on the spot, but are there no, any examples? I think um, so I do think that when you think about uh, people who work on, say, gender, they don't just work on women. They, you know, they talk about what it, what what's important for women to be uh, uh, to change the structure of how women's work is valued, right? So. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's that, it's that. It's just to be able to say, you know, not just women in the home, not just women in the workplace, but what does it mean for women to be recognized as equals as half of humanity, you know, in everything that they do, in all of their objectives. Um, so that I think is, has probably, I think of them as being a very cross-sectoral, although my friends who work on gender say it's horrible to be told, seen as just a gender expert and nothing else, right? Um, so I think that that's a good example. I think actually that um, in some ways, in some, in some parts of health, we've done a much better, they've done a much better job of thinking through all of primary health issues and not just one or the other or the third and being able to integrate it across different areas. Although again, people who work on primary health will say it's been forgotten. So I think that this glass half full, glass half empty thing happens in every part of development, right? Because there isn't sort of an end goal where you say, oh, now we're at perfect. Now we're at perfection and now we can stop working. Um, so I'm just thinking uh, that in order to move towards that end goal of perfection, <laughs> I don't think there is an end. So, uh, we have to bring more people together with us. And I, yeah. I think that uh, perhaps Keith's reporting and uh, will help us to build those bridges with people who don't know enough about water and sanitation and hygiene. Um, so maybe that's a good, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, yeah. The second would be to become much more strategic about how we communicate and with whom we communicate um, and who we bring into our rooms and and, and with whom we're willing to make sacrifices, you know? Yeah, so it's uh, as much about the process as it is about the end goal, right? How Absolutely. Do you, how you achieve that goal is gonna really um, either avoid unintended consequences or allow you to realize, you know, broader uh, benefits. Correct. Um, Duncan, how about, how about you? <laughs> what progress would you like to see us build on? Yeah, I uh, so I I'll, I'll speak you know specifically for my subsector and you know rural water maintenance because the water sector is quite big. Uh, I I think there's a, a huge opportunity now to have rural water funding for this rural water space transition to be more like what Joel's talking about, where you have these huge data sets that set benchmarks. They're able to uh, quantify the level of operational and financial efficiency in the institutional context in a way that allow us to target resources efficiently. And then from that, find the right money for the right risk. So if you're working in the Central African Republic and it's a really tough place to work and the financial efficiency is low and the institutional context is really tough, fine, we can find you know, the type of funder who says, well, if you can support services for 5 million people at a subsidy of less than a dollar per person per year, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm willing to participate in that, uh, you know, that socioeconomic outcome has value to me. I, I think we can transition to that as the norm for the rural water space in a way that, uh, as Tommy's talking about, starts to draw in new people. Maybe uh, new types of funders who aren't familiar with the rural water space, because as Keith said, you know, we do we do a bad job of publicity. Um, you know, if you put uh, money into uh, rural Burkina Faso, you know, what it, what what's what's happening with that? What level of results is being achieved? Um, how is that catalyzing a transition towards a more sustainable service over time? If we can show that in a really clear, transparent, data-driven way, you know, can we start to engage new, new types of resources for this space uh, that are maybe willing to, uh, to take the risk of, of you know, working in, in harder last mile contexts or you know, types of funders who, who don't need a financial return but are, are very comfortable with that. Yeah, 
Uh, so that's what I hope to see in the next, uh, uh, you know, even the near future. I think we we have a real opportunity to uh, to demonstrate a new way of working, uh, you know, very soon. Great, thank you, Duncan. Uh, Sheila, over to you. Uh, if you could talk about, you know, where the the progress that you've seen over the last decade or so that can be built on to achieve SDG six. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think my colleagues have mentioned a lot of, you know, great progress and, and great thoughts that, you know, I was just noting down um, as, as, as what I wanted to speak to as well. So yeah, of course, we've had like a lot of great progress. I'll speak for Sanergy and in Kenya, uh, we've been operational for 12 years. And so we have seen um, a lot of progress, you know, from government partnerships to community partnerships, even to the cross sector partnerships as well. Um, because what we have seen is that, like I told you, our model is built from, you know, from the ground up and, and being able to have a participatory um, situation where, where communities are participating and, and uh, corporates are participating, you know, um, funders are participating where everyone is really contributing to the to the sanitation kitty is what has made you know us make such good progress being able to provide products and services that are valuable to people and being able to to you know expand our our, our resource you know basket um, for us to to be able to 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 provide these solutions you know um, sustainably and and in the long run the other thing is that um, also speaking to the cross sector um, partnerships and especially um, speaking uh, with government, our model is touches on, on, on almost all of them. So we work, you know, with, with farmers, uh, we work with, you know, health practitioners. And so what we have, what we have really been working on, uh, seeing that government especially has been our key key stakeholder, is that we've been able to bring all of these stakeholders together. Um, a lot of, you know, government, um, um, government offices will be very fragmented um, whereby you have you know um, a certain doc for example health is divided into three other you know subsectors and us being able to bring all of these people and showing them the interlinkages um, between you know um, sanitation and waste management you know sanitation and agriculture you know sanitation and climate resilience being able to bring all of these you know stakeholders together and really showing that you know sanitation is interlinked to all of this has then helped you know us build you know stronger policies um that that then you know enable sanitation to thrive and also other you know sectors to be able to see um the importance of building partnerships um, with us. So that has really, you know, worked worked well, and and I'd want to see like that forge forge on, build on um, from that partnership, um, because what Sanaji is doing is that expanding and really reaching, going beyond Nairobi and beyond Kenya to other African cities and and you know. Uh, cities across the world, we are really looking at partnering with, with government and being able to, you know, work, work with, with them for, you know, um, in, in terms of policies, in terms of implementation, in terms of even just advisory, you know, working together to be able to find solutions that um, are feasible um, to today's context. Um, seeing that, you know, um, government is also not very um, uh, flexible, you know, to adopt new solutions. And so how can, you know, other, is it private sectors, you know, NGOs, how can they leverage um, to be able to reach where, you know, maybe government may not be amenable to, you know, to stretch. Um, yeah, so I think the, this, those are the three main uh, areas where I see a lot of, you know, growth, uh, potential growth. And if we build partnerships in those three areas, then um, we are sure likely to hit um, our SDG six, um, basically all SDGs. That's true, actually. It's pretty broadly applicable. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Sheila. Joel, what do you think? Um, look, I think uh, there has been progress. Myself, I'm an optimist. Um, I'm cautious, however. I think we have a lot of work to do. I think that work definitely needs to be focused at the country and subnational level. Water, unlike the power sector, tends to be a, a local service provision. And um, 
you know, in the various tiers of government, subnational governments tend to have the biggest challenges and water is, is very indicative of that and sanitation even more so, but it's clearly doable. I mean, you've heard the stories um, about some of the successes. There's other stories elsewhere in the world. I mean, Bangladesh went from uh, a large percent of the population doing open defecation to almost three or 4% in a 10 year period. It's doable, all of this is doable. The good news is we know what to do. Um, there's not much we, we, we don't know in terms of uh, solving the problem. Uh, technology will make it easier, there's no doubt about it, but we have to be careful sometimes technology um, uh, is, a, is a guise for some of the solutions. When we were using smart meters, um, you know, very impressive, very good technology, but at the end of the day, if the collection rate doesn't increase, that technology hasn't helped us what we need to do. So I think we need to focus at the national and subnational level. I think we have to um, strategize a little bit more on what the priorities are. You know, if you look at subsidies, we recently completed a study. Um, the vast majority, I think 60% of subsidies go to the highest quintile. You know, that's not sustainable. We can't keep doing that. We've got to get more sophisticated in how we use our money. Uh, and uh, you know, talking about capacity, I mean, there's a lot of organizations that are preparing and have tools that are available to service providers across the globe. I mean, when COVID hit, we immediately put out a model for service providers to look at the financial impact that COVID was having on their operations. Uh, next week, we're releasing an open a MOOC on our open learning campus on the financing tools. Um, so there's a wealth of information. All of our material is open source, um, but material in and of itself doesn't get us to where we need to be. And I think the last and key part of that is really political leadership. And we need to find a better voice. It was amazing to me to watch how quickly the health sector mobilized um, during COVID. Um, and nobody talked about closing utilities, uh, sorry, closing hospitals or cutting back in the health sector. They charged off, they put together a good argument and they secured the resources. We got a number of calls from utilities that were really worried about their financial viability in COVID. Um, and that shouldn't be happening. Water was a key component to the solution. We need to up our game. We need to get more efficient um, and we need to do a better job of getting our message across, particularly to political leadership in country to make sure we get the resources that are required for the sector. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. We have a number of questions that come, have come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and pose some of those um, for the Q&A. Um, here's a question from uh, Susan Davis, the Chief of Party for USAID's Global Waters Communications and Knowledge Management Program. Um, Joel, I think this one is for you. We often talk about collective action at the national level. Are there examples of funders and lenders like the World Bank, USAID, and Hilton Foundation working in collective action to more efficiently support system strengthening? Sorry, thanks. Yeah. You want to go on? Or you want to do? No, go uh, ahead. Sorry, okay. over to you. <laughs> so, look, I, you know, the risk of focusing on our efforts. I think um, this think tank that we run um, with support from uh, Gates and USAID and a number of other bilateral donors. I think we're the largest think bank working in the water sector and emerging markets. And we focus exactly on these, the breadth of issues that are referred to from inclusion to sanitation, to, to water supply, rural and urban. Um, and we're constantly looking at, at the challenges going forward. Um, having said that, the implement, you know, putting the information out there is, is great but making sure that the information is used is critical. And I think that's one of the advantages of um, what we're trying to do. We don't just put information out there. We try to share it in our policy dialogues with government and subnational leadership as well at the local level, academia, private sector, regulators, the whole wealth of organizations but we also build it into our lending operations. And we do this in partnership with other lenders and other bilateral donors. 
and also with um, other public interest groups that are working in the water sector from very large organizations to very local organizations. We have operations in about 65 countries around the world and the emphasis, I cannot stress this enough, really needs to be at that local level. That's where water is. And that's where we're going to make the difference. Thank you, Joel. Uh, this is a question from Mark Radin, a PhD student at the University of North Carolina and a former student of Professor Nagpal's. He says, for years, development partners have supplied funding for installing and constructing new wash infrastructure with the assumption that communities would cover operations and maintenance costs. However, oftentimes the funding for operation and maintenance never materializes. Should development partners start including these costs in future programs or only support new projects in areas that offer clear commitments to funding operation and maintenance? More generally, how has the WASH community incorporated sustainable de service delivery into our approaches for financing WASH programs and projects? So I, I'm, I'm just going to start this off only because, hi, Mark. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that we've actually come a very long way. And the fact that we're even really taking this head on is really important because it, it, for a very long time, you know, good practice dictates that and public, public administration logic dictates sort of this idea of incidence of benefit at the local level, which basically means that, you know, municipal governments or local governments, as Joel says, who are responsible for the delivery of local services will know what's the level of demand among the local population and therefore create a level of service and tax it or create tariffs at a level which they understand and which people can pay for. And that's all sort of theoretically, <laughs> uh, based on this idea that, 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 that service delivery at the local level, at least the operation and maintenance of it at the local level is determined through, a, through the, a very express demand from local people. And what we know very clearly is that those systems have not materialized because as Joel said, tariffs, taxes, systems of subsidies are not designed at the local level. They're often designed at the central level and they are not, and, and local consumption is not supported. Local demand is not understood at the central level. So I think we are at this sort of, we commonly now understand, especially it, Joel's group has done a lot of work on this, that we have to, un we have to unpack this idea of OPEX and maintenance expenditures being generated locally. We understand that they don't happen. We would like to get to a point where they do happen because clearly in the, in the West that does happen, in many industrialized countries that does happen. And for long-term financial sustainability of service providers, that's absolutely essential. So whether Duncan's working on what is the level of subsidy that's needed per person served, or Joel is working on how to clarify those tax rates or tariff rates, that is exactly the heart of what we're coming to. Um, so I do think that, that the question, the challenge has been unpacked. We haven't been able to find a solution to it. Thank you, Tanvi. Does anybody else want to jump in on that? I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, <laughs> uh, I completely agree with Tanvi, not surprising. Um, I think we, we have a much deeper appreciation of O&M um, and we build it into our projects. But when we leave, it has to be local government responsibility. I think the key is financial viability analysis at the beginning. We need to not look at individual, the viability of individual projects, but we need to look at what the impact is on the service provider across the board. It can be a very good project, much needed, but at the end of the day, if that infrastructure isn't gonna help generate revenue to cover O and M, um, you can actually do more damage than good despite the best intentions. So I think we have a deeper appreciation of this. We just need to uh, get better at it. So making sure we do financial viability analyses, 
at the national level, we're really trying to reinvigor the public expenditure reviews, you know, really look at what government is spending in the water sector. And that's really difficult because the investments in water come from all kinds of places. You know, the energy bill related, we're spending 10% of our electricity moving water around the world. And sometimes we get a big subsidy from the energy department. We need to take that into consideration. Sometimes the staff at the local level running the utility are paid by the public service commission. So we really need to get a better handle on the full range of investments that government is putting into the sector. And then we need to rationalize it because often those benefits are serving the wealthy rather than the poor. Again, I don't mean to sound so negative, but I think we are understanding it. We know what to do. Uh, we just have to get better on the implementation side. Thanks. Go ahead, Duncan. Yeah, if I could just add, add one more thing to that is to pick up on Joel's previous point as well about the importance of the institutional piece in that is that the, how, how much the financial uh, analysis is influenced by the institutional context. So if a service provider has an exclusive mandate, if the messaging from political leaders to communities is don't pay for water, it should be free, you know, all of those things can really impact uh, beyond just a sort of, you know, conventional business analysis. Um, there's that, that other piece there that, that really uh, influences what's achieved in a given context. Thank you, Duncan. Sheila, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think I can chime in, in um, from, a, from a customer's perspective. Um, and one of the questions we were asking ourselves, you know, when we were building out the, the, the fresh life model is the willingness of the customer to pay and contribute to the, you know, sanitation kitty. And, and what we realized is that um, initially before um, Sanaji, you know, installed uh, toilets into the communities, yes, we did have like a, a big challenge because we there were you know initiatives coming building toilets there's no one to maintain them and so um, they, they don't see you know the sustainability of it gets lost there so um, when 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 we were building out the 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 fresh life model then it, uh, it required a lot of you know building trust and what we found out is that customers sometimes already pay for these services only that they pay just sometimes they pay and they don't get very quality services. So the willingness to pay we realize is actually there. Um, and what people want is at least quality services. And so um, the Fresh Life model is actually built off of that. Um, being able to provide quality um, and sustainable, you know, service, making sure that, you know, it's the service is there. People can access clean toilets throughout. Um, then um, the willingness to pay, to pay has been there. Again, just bringing in the, 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 the participatory aspect um, where, you know, the, the community is chiming in, you know, um, and, and we are being able to, for example, for Sanaji's case, um, being able to, again, generate revenues um, to be able to create a very, you know, sustainable um, system um, across board. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Sheila. Keith, I have a question for you um, from Kirsten Dennert, director of Ask for Amer or sorry, Ask for Water GmbH. Um, we have tried to reach out and inform the public through journalists, but how can this be done? Within projects, we have reached out to journalists in the past and even paid journalists to report on projects. But where are the journalists and media organizations with an interest in WASH and water resources more widely? Yeah. Give an answer for that. I mean, this is a whole discussion. Let's do the short course on this, right? So um, in, in the United States and in too many other places, journalism, communications, public reporting has declined in its interest in these complex kinds of issues, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> I can't address all of that. What I can tell you is that there's, th this question goes to the new models that are approaching in our own business, my own business in communications. So, much of the great reporting in the United States and in the world now is being done on a nonprofit communications, nonprofit reporting, nonprofit journalism organizations. They are partnering, right? So we partner, Circle of Blue partners with the Wilson Center. We partnered with other people, ProPublica, which is an important investigative news service in our country, partners with all kinds of other um, news organizations. The Guardian is a nonprofit news group. I think that, I think we're the, 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 uh, the, the genesis of uh, 
and the, the structure of reporting of this kind of complexity and magnitude is not going to come from mainstream media. It's going to come from the nonprofit uh, specialty media. And then hopefully that media elevates and there is a journalistic elevation, journalistic elevator process where really great reporting rises to the level of attention globally. This, this project right here might be one of those. I mean, the fact that, that, that I was privileged enough to be able to dig in for months on such an enormous project, um, understand its dimensions, try to understand its complexity, uh, and then develop uh, fact-based narratives around that may in itself help elevate WASH to other places. We've found that, well, I'll just say one more piece about this. When Circle of Blue got started, um, when I joined Circle of Blue and Circle of Blue got started in the first decade of the 20th century, 21st century, um, the water story was basically a wash story. It was a wash delivery story. It was, it was about bacteria and diarrhea and disease. That was basically the global water story. Circle Blue helped to expand that story into the kinds of other sectors that we're talking about here, energy, health, uh, utilities, uh, finance, right? Uh, agriculture. We understood at climate, we understood that, that water was this matrix around which we could tell the story of the 21st century. And our little group, our little group out of Traverse City, Michigan, working with Wilson Center, elevated this other story to its, pop, its prominence now, to the extent that, you know, that, that the 2015 Paris Climate Accord was influenced because we developed, you know, dealt with Wilson Center in China to understand the dimensions of the water, energy, to agricultural conflict in China, which became a part of the U.S. China Climate Agreement, which was the diplomatic breakthrough that led to the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. So um, I guess that's a, a, a self self marketing thing, but I'm just saying that Kirsten, who has been really helpful to me in just just uh, understanding a lot of the dimensions here. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, it's not going to come from mainstream media. It's not going to come from CBS News. It's not going to come from CNN. They're going to embrace reporting and understanding of the dimensions is from people like us, from this project will help, I think, hopefully elevate the wash sector in its importance in you know, human progress. Thank you, Keith. Um, and I'm sorry, I have a helicopter outside, so I, hopefully it's not too loud. Um, I sort of getting back to Keith talks in his reporting about this galaxy of organizations and institutions and individuals working in the sector. There are two questions that have come in that are sort of related to that galaxy and how to tap into it and how to contribute to it. So there's a question from Jim uh, Bruckbauer. There are thousands of wonderful institutions, organizations and efforts that are advancing the WASH goals. If someone would like to use their skills and abilities to accelerate the WASH goals, how do they navigate through the sea of different efforts? Is there a need for better coordination among the smaller individual efforts so that people can understand where to plug in? It's almost overwhelming. So he's just looking for some advice. Um, and a related question from Jason Hubbard is a professor and director of the Institute of Water Security and Science at West Virginia University. How can individuals heavily engaged in WASH in many ways at both local to regional levels that wish to dedicate more time and resources to this global effort become more engaged internationally? How and where do we make the right contacts? So as folks that are, are very deeply engaged in this sector, it would be interesting to hear if you have some advice for where they can tap into the sector um, at different levels, I'd say. So it sort of sounds like um, from the from the local all the way up to these international engagements. Duncan, I guess Duncan, and then I'll go. Oh, thanks, Tammy. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that I, I will take this opportunity to highlight is that Uptime is launching a global survey with REACH and RWSN to identify service providers globally that uh, could participate in you know, a potential scale up of, of this type of project. Uh, so we're actively looking for contacts, particularly in lower and lower middle income countries uh, who are doing this work in you know, rural water maintenance services. And so please uh, check the RWSN website for more details on that. We expect the survey to be live in the next probably week or so, um, or you can contact me directly. 
Uh, but that's a very, uh, I think, tangible thing that we're trying to, uh, to get off the ground now to broaden the engagement. Thanks, Duncan. Tanvi? Um, I think that uh, the name of the organization is evading me. I'm just going to give you one example, but um, Keith highlighted it in, um, in his reporting, Peter Macy's group that works um, essentially uh, with a lot of uh, volunteers who do direct advising to utilities. Um, and so I think that that's one, if you are somebody who, you know, would like to be directly engaged with strengthening um, local utilities, uh, I think that's an incredible opportunity. I'm, I'm not going to go into how smaller NGOs should be involved in the larger scheme of things, because that's a conversation for another day. But just sort of in keeping with today's uh, conversation about how to engage more directly and strengthen governments and the service providers themselves, this would be a, a, a good entry point. Thank you, Tanvi. Joel. Um, the name of that group is Rock Blue. They're based in Cape Town and they help utilities. I'm sure Peter's online or reachable um, on the web. Look, I, I, you know, I think this is an, it's an incredibly complex sector. You know, we haven't gone outside of WASH, but, you know, 70% of water goes to agriculture, you know, um, something like 60% of global fresh water withdrawals come from transboundary sources. Um, so this is, you know, and we haven't even touched on those issues and they are very, very political and very, very difficult. So it's, the question is not a surprise. It, it can be overwhelming. And I think it really depends on a couple of things as Duncan alluded to, you know, it depends where your interest is. It depends which aspect of water are you interested in? If it's sanitation or utilities or, or um, gender issues and inclusion issues, transboundary. I mean, you, you can pick your sector to get involved in. There is probably an organization that's involved in it, both from the public advocacy side, which is one aspect of it, but the other, and, and frankly, in some ways, a little bit more meaningful is the delivery at the local level, the, the organizations like Duncan's Group and Synergy and, and others. And there's a slew of them around the world and they're doing very, very good work. Um, we do need to get more strategic and I think um, kind of come on some central themes that we want to identify and make sure that we target the right organizations, but there's no shortage of places where people can get involved. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. Uh, slightly different iteration of that question. Um, is from Eliza Roberts, Project Director for Sustainability, Energy and Climate Change at WSP USA, which is an engineering professional services firm. What role can companies play in tackling WASH challenges globally? Where has this been done well and what is needed? So looking at the role of the private sector. I can help a little bit start that conversation. Please. So in my reporting, I, I tripped over this group of major companies called the Toilet Coalition. These are, these are major people involved in, in sanitation. But I can tell you that in my repeated efforts to reach any of them, they ignored it. So I'm not sure where, what that means about companies participation, but certainly what it means about companies participation and, and public knowledge about their participation is weak. So if anybody in the Toilet Coalition is listening today, please answer my calls next time. Thank you, Keith. Does anybody else want to jump in on that? I'm happy to take a crack. Um, again, I, I think I would break it down a little bit. You know, the private sector on financing, um, you know, can include banks, microfinance institutions, pension funds, insurance companies. There's a host of groups that are involved on the financing side. On the service provision, I mean, you have consulting operations looking at every aspect of water sector um, delivery. They're slightly different from operators who want to come in. You see a number of countries where the private sector is running desal plants, doing the kind of work that Synergy is doing on reuse and uh, the circular economy, which is absolutely essential. Um, and I think we see even more and more involvement in the private sector around the issue of water and climate change. You know, 
we are struggling to get water at a seat at the table at the COPS and making sure that water is front and center on the climate debate in all organizations. I don't think we're there yet. Um, so people advocating for the water issue around the whole climate change discussion. You have issues, we've talked about the energy and water nexus, but I think it's equally important to talk about the nexus between water and agriculture, given that agriculture is such a huge user of water, um, people advocating from that end in the agriculture sector, more efficiency, more synergy and more sustainability is absolutely essential. So the private sector has a huge role in this across the board, even in sanitation. We've seen the private sector come in, the microfinance institutions in, in, uh, in Bangladesh. You know, we started off with a small results-based finance program there, which was a grant-based uh, helping microfinance institutions fund toilets, uh, not very different from off-grid energy systems. So the household was responsible. Today, I think it's seven years later, we have a $300 million investment in that and it will move to scale. And the energy sector in Bangladesh on off-grid is a $500 million, sorry, a $50 million a year investment uh, and we hope to get that in sanitation. So there's a huge scope for private sector in this. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. Give anybody else a minute to jump in before I move on to the next question. Okay. Um, the one thing I think that we have to separate out is whether it's um, the private sector wanting to integrate its operations for profits into the sector or whether the question was more related to how the private sector could contribute sort of knowledge and technology towards the sector, but in, in a different kind of a role. And I think those two things are, are separate and Joel has already alluded to them in terms of the, the contribution of operators and affirmage contractors, et cetera, versus the role of, say, Unilever in helping to build behavior change campaigns, right? So those two things are completely separate and, and equally important, but I think we have to, we have to be, be really cognizant that, that, you know, the private sector is, existence is based on profits and public de service delivery is not premised on the, on the, on the, creation of profits. So it's just it's just two different kinds of uh, entities that we have to kind of merge together to bring and, and, and also their goals could be quite divergent. So we need to make sure that we keep those two separate because when we've brought those two together, it's resulted in a very non-productive conversation in the wash sector. Uh, <laughs> and we have to really be really careful about not going in that direction. Thank you, Tanvi. Joel, did you want to jump in? No, I just wanted to, I, I didn't want to go into that last thing that Tanvi uh, was referring to the hand washing coalition, which is a public private partnership, really looking at the whole issue of hand washing that's been around for a long time and, and frankly done great work. And with COVID, their, um, their profile raised significantly. So that's another option and another way that the private sector has got involved. I should say, and picking up on Tanvi's point, the level and scope of private sector engagement at the national and subnational level really depends on the government's openness to that. You know, no one's forcing anybody from the private sector to come in either from the push side or the pull side. So each government, each local authority has to make up their mind on how they want to go about it, but it is certainly an option that's worth considering. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, this next question, Sheila, I'm going to pass it to you first. Um, it's from Kimberly Slind Lem, the Director of Program Learning and Influence at Water for People. Understanding that the mandate is at the subnational and local level, there are elements of getting systems to work for effective and efficient service delivery that sit at the national level, which I think we've covered a fair amount today. Have any of the panelists seen effective approaches to bridging that national local split? So I wonder if you could talk about your experience working sort of across the scales of decision making within the context of Nairobi, but how you're working with sort of local officials all the way up to the national level and how you bridge bridge those conversations. Yeah, sure. Um, rightly so, uh, government is uh, within uh, very many tiers. 
And so what Sanergy has done is that we have we have built a, a government relations team, you know, a team that specifically, you know, builds and maintains those, those relationships because we are seeing that, you know, with government, we have two key areas. We have the operational uh, areas uh, and we also have the, the policy and advocacy areas. So what, what we are doing at every level, starting from the lowest, which is the chief and the community leaders, we have people who engage and who, who engage at that level um, and who know um, what exactly is going on uh, at Sanergy and a lot of our operations um, and, and, and basically the, the, the sector as well. Um, so again, at the, at the policy level, we also have you know, a team that will then build those relationships and kind of, you know, um, know what's what's happening um and and be able to contribute to to the sector and also in and, and also um engage them in our own operations so that then we are you know we build a kind of you know a relationship for for you know building a greater environment and also um successful operations um that said we also have um the other thing that is um just making sure that you know it is um participatory and really you no know, the point i wanted to say is the capacity building capacity you know wash is such a broad topic as as we've all seen and um you know trying to build the capacity of you know of all of us um we are all trying to learn the sector both government private sector ngos really working together to enhance our capacity and expand our knowledge on how to best provide you know sustainable solutions so um being able to really build um, our capacity both as synergy and also within government exchanging knowledge a lot has really helped in terms of you know building synergies that are able to strengthen um, our operations and strengthen the sector as a whole thank you sheila anybody else want to jump in on that how do you, how to engage across go ahead Duncan. Yeah, I can quickly touch on that just from the uptime perspective. So all, all of the service providers we're working with are also engaging uh, at, the, at the either subnational or national level in various capacities to try and you know influence policy and wider uptake of the approach. Uh, so it's very much you know the partners who are the sharp end of that interaction um, as it as it should be because they're they're in country, and uh, and I'd say like what we what we really need to do to, to further that engagement is be able to demonstrate results uh, over a longer period and at progressively bigger scales. Um, when I used to work in Uganda, the, the ministry would say to me, you know, this is interesting, but it's, you know, a few hundred hand pumps in one district. I'm managing, you know, 25,000 hand pumps across the country. When you can, you know, show me results at that scale and retire some of the risk around that, you know, then I'll consider it for a national policy. And I understand that. That makes sense. Um, so I think that's where, you know, there's still work needed to do is, is we need to, we need to get beyond the pilot stage, um, even if it's really interesting work. And, uh, and then that's, uh, you know, maintain those engagements, but then, you know, that's where we're really going to transition from, you know, small scale pilot with philanthropy to larger engagements and maybe, you know, a country level uptake. Thank you, Duncan. Let's see, I'm looking at the time. We just have two more minutes about so i think i might ask you one final round and i'll invite you all to take 30 seconds to 60 seconds this is a question from carl ganter at circle of blue uh how do we not lose this inflection point if we say there is progress how do we ensure that doesn't impede the work that remains to achieve universal access to wash so uh, you, you got about i'd say 30 seconds Yep, about 20 to 30 seconds. Sorry, I keep making it shorter as I keep talking. Um, answer that question. And then if you have any other final remarks you, that you want to make before we go to our closing remarks. Thank you. Let's see, I'm going to start with you, Keith. Well, I've said it, you know, several times here, um, more reporting, more reporting on the intense work that's going on, the wonderful personalities, the amazing stories, the key questions about partnerships and governance and government interest, uh, raising this to the national international level that, that of attention that that it that it merits. Um, I think it's just an amazing story. I, you know, I had no idea it was it was happening, even though I'd covered it at the local level. But it's 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 international dimensions is is one of the important stories on the planet. And um, we ought to go at that. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Tanvi. 
I was afraid you were going to ask me next and, you know, I've been learning from everybody on the panel and just repeating what they say. So, uh, uh, so I'm going to, again, talk about something else. I think that one thing that we absolutely have to highlight is the fact that uh, the sector has learned a great deal. And not only has it learned a great deal, it has learned a great deal with a great deal more rigor. Um, and I'm going back to Duncan or to Sanergy's example. And I think when I started in the sector, there were a lot of phantom statistics that we used to cite over and over and over again. And I am, if we could just for a moment decide just to put those aside and rebuild a narrative based on the evidence that we have gathered about things that work and stick to that um, and learn how to turn big ships that are heading in the wrong direction around, uh, we can really, really make headway. And I think, uh, we're, we are inching in that direction, but I think there's two things. So that those two things are something that I would like to put, put really my weight behind. One is just sort of this creation of very transparent co-created partnerships that are strong, where we have allies who can push us in that same direction. And the second would be to really double down on, on being able to defend how we know what we know and, and to be able to um, share that in ways that people understand. So using Keats sort of abilities, but also supporting people like Duncan and, you know, the entire Synergy team or everybody else out there who has very deliberately and in a data-driven and transparent way sh shared what it is that they're doing and how it works, even though it could take a long time <laughs> to get there longer and, than, than we had an, anticipated, you know. Thank you, Tanvi. Sheila? Um, I think the key takeaway for me has been like active participation, um, making sure that, you know, as we take stock of everything we have, we have, we have achieved so far, it's knowing that we all have, you know, a, stay, a, a role to play to be able to advance this even further. So um, when working together is, is what it takes. So everyone really participating right from, you know, um, the community level to the government level, to the funding level, to private uh, stakeholders level, um, a participatory approach uh, would work. And again, for this, uh, the conversation to keep going, again, going back to also uh, kids' statement of really um, impact, impactful storytelling of where we've come and what needs to happen. Um, so keeping the conversation going and having um, those active participation, um, having an active participation of everyone, um, I think would, would help us maintain the momentum. That's great, thank you, Sheila. Uh, Duncan? Thanks. I, I'd also like to pick up on the theme of, you know, using the, the data and the results to really transparently link the right type of funding to results in, in different contexts and to do so at scale. We, we have to get beyond the pilots to, to really address the issue at the SDG level. Uh, so for uptime, you know, our level of ambition is services for 100 million people. So two orders of magnitude above where we are, you know, for Synergy, you know, Synergy in every city in, uh, in Africa over, over here in Dar es Salaam. Um, and, uh, you know, get, getting, really getting to that breakthrough level is, uh, is, is what I think we need to do. Thank you, Duncan. And Joel, final word to you. Thanks. So a couple of things. I think we need to really focus on the foundational issues of technical and financial efficiency and the policy and institutional and regulatory framework. We get that right. I think we're on the way. Um, I think we, and, and that's the case, whether you're a rural sanitation organism provider in rural Malawi or the San Paulo um, Metro water utility, it, it cuts across the board. Everyone needs to do it. Second thing would pick up on Duncan's point about getting to scale. Um, we're not gonna reach the SDG if we don't start upping our game. And finally, I'd say we need to focus on the local level, um, but make sure our message gets to the political leadership at the national level, because that's where the purse strings are. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. And thank you all for a really extraordinary conversation. I've certainly learned a lot um, and, and look forward to 
to keeping the conversation going in future sessions. It's now my privilege to introduce Peter Laharn, who serves as the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Conrad and Hilton Foundation. He has 30 years of foundation and nonprofit experience internationally, with a focus on improving the well being of children in underinvested communities. He previously served as the Executive Director of the Firelight Foundation and of the Bernard Van Leer Foundation. Peter, over to you for closing remarks. Thanks, Lauren. Um, first, I, I want to thank everyone for thoughtful and really energizing discussions from Ambassador Green to Moorberry Boyle from USAID and for the terrific panel we've just heard from. And of course, thanks as well to Circle of Blue for keeping water issues and water solutions at the forefront. Uh, the Hilton Foundation is very glad to support discussions like this that are purposeful and, and uh, that drive us forward. Uh, like Ambassador Green and like Mora, I saw early on in my own career in North and West Africa with Peace Corps and Save the Children, the difficulties posed by uh, lack of access to water and lack of water quality. And I'm really encouraged by the, the progress that has been made in the last 30 years and looking forward to putting our shoulders to this issue with all of you for the next, uh, the next chapter. Uh, the Hilton Foundation itself has supported the improvement of water services in Africa for about 30 years. And I will be the first to admit that we started with an ineffective approach. We, uh, I think Tanvi knows this from her experience with us. We, we started with what might be called in American parlance, a Johnny Appleseed approach, where you drill well here, a borehole there, and you hope that it adds up and you hope that it holds together. Or if you drill it, they will come. Uh, and we didn't have much concern for sustainability. We didn't even have the ambition that pipe water on premises in Africa was a possibility let alone a goal to be systematically pursued. Uh, we've realized that this is not a successful way to work. And I think like the wash sector, we've stretched, we've grown in that time. And today our focus is resolutely on building sustainable, well-governed district water authorities. Like all of you, Hilton Foundation is a strong advocate of SDG 6, particularly target 6.1 on safe drinking water for all. We believe that every person, every health facility, every school in the world should have access to reliable, affordable, and safe water services. We believe that sustainable and, and safe water services underpin development and prosperity, driving health, social, economic outputs for everyone, especially those living in underinvested communities. Now, I agree with Keith's point that the world has made substantial, substantial progress and that this should be celebrated. And I also believe that we really need to tackle the question of how to provide that last meter of pipe in a way that's financially sustainable and that will be resilient against the foreseeable shocks of the 21st century. Uh, we believe that WASH, uh, the WASH community should continually ask ourselves the sort of question that Bill Gates asked his colleagues on, on public health issues. How could we eliminate this problem for the whole world? In this case, how could feasibly water and sanitation be provided for all in a, in a financially sustainable way. Now, the good thing from my perspective about the wash sector is that we know the basics. We know the basics of infrastructure, water delivery, governance. We don't, for the most part, need technological breakthroughs to deliver what we want to do. Uh, instead, as, as all of you have eloquently said, we need to look at solid data and closing data gaps. We need to look at inadequate models of sustainable water delivery. We need to look at unclear water, uh, water governance and how all of this results in unnecessary lack of safe water. Uh, and you know, it's, uh, so the, the encouraging thing is that this is not rocket science. The, the challenging thing is that it is, it's really wrapped up in soft skills and in political commitments. Uh, but I think we're getting smarter and smarter about that. At the Hilton Foundation, our, game, our, our aim is now to uh, narrow gaps between those living in disadvantage and others. And our new strategy is focusing on locally driven system strengthening model, which focuses on providing safe and sustainably managed water delivery at a district level. And we hope that this will be a contribution to a real drive to full attainment of SDG 6. Um, specifically, we are focused on the district level and feel that a strong district authority supported by regional and national levels by, and by finance and leadership can provide safe and sustainable uh, water for every household, every school and every healthcare facility at the local level by 2030. Um, 
this emphasis on the district at this, this unit of district scale also provides the convening space to plan and implement services uh, with the involvement of health, of water, of government, civil society, and the private sector. And I agree strongly with Joel's points that uh, efficiency and governance are crucial uh, at this level and at others, and that they can be system systematically built up. And I think that's a, a really important point for us all to focus on. Uh, we need to look at the, the, the big picture, tackle the incentive structure throughout, looking at issues beyond infrastructure to understand systemic issues, root causes that cause uh, subpar uh, service delivery. This includes incentive structures, governance issues, motivations. So a lot of the soft skill questions and the, frankly, the accountability questions that you were all talking about. Um, you know, and I, I would just, um, I want to say in listening to the, this panel, uh, I'm thinking that we have so much of what is needed to get to water and sanitation for all. We have uh, listened to yourselves, listened to the quality of the questions. We have tremendous technical competence and expertise. Uh, we have a recognition at all levels that water is a basic need. And we have a willingness at every level from the household to the national level, the global level to invest money and labor in, in, uh, in obtaining water. Um, that's not the case for every sector that the Hilton Foundation works in. You know, so I think the, if you like the commercializability of this and the willingness at every level to invest is really important. I think we have a growing degree of financial uh, competence, although probably not the degree, well, I, I can say clearly not the degree that we need in order to be able to finance the, uh, um, the attainment of SDG 6. Now, so what is still needed? And as I'm listening to folks, I, I hear it from all of you. I, I think um, we have the technical capacity to propose solutions on this, but I don't think we have, uh, if, you, if you like, governance at a global scale. We don't have a global sense of responsibility for delivering on SDG 6. And I think that needs to be built up. Um, I've often worked with technical counterpoints, the counterparts at the World Bank or USAID, and you feel, okay, that organization is on my side. But it is not until the political leadership of those organizations are also bought in. So I think we have to help all the technical knowledge that is on this panel develop the political commitment within those organizations, multilateral, bilateral, UN system, uh, that this is a, a key priority and a deliverable one. It's, uh, it is one that we can orchestrate into delivery. So I think we all need to work on our political competence. I, I think it would be very handy to have a playbook for multi-stakeholder partnerships uh, with various levels of government, with private sector, with civil society, uh, even the role that philanthropy can most, uh, most usefully play. Uh, and specifically on that, I think clearly we need, we need private capital as well as government capital in, in, um, in financing the, the, the gap on delivering these services. Uh, we also, I think, should aim philanthropic capital at the right level. We, we have only a very small drop in this bucket. Uh, so we should look at the most valuable ways to invest our, our, our resources. Those are in testing, in catalyzing, in de-risking, and I think in doing some of the cajoling and poking um, that, that, that this panel is pointing, pointing toward. And I, I agree very strongly with Joel's points as well. Um, we need to build efficiency at each level of, of systems, and we know how to do that systematically. We just have to do it more thoroughly and more broadly. And we really have to think through what are the soft skills and what are the mutual commitments that hold those governance pieces uh, together. I think when we've done all those things, uh, we have a very powerful uh, case. We have a, a powerful investment case and we can, uh, we can pull it off together. So we at the Hilton Foundation will work alongside all of you on this and we're confident that significant progress can be made. Thanks very much. Back to you. Thank you, Peter. That was a really perfect way to wrap up a very robust discussion. Uh, I, we are over our time, so I'm going to go ahead and very quickly thank all of our panelists today for such a rich and thoughtful discussion. I want to thank Circle of Blue for your partnership in the series and the Hilton Foundation for their generous support of the series. Thank you, uh, Peter, Mora, and Ambassador Green for providing such 
strong bookends to the discussion. The recording of today's event will be available on the Wilson Center event page in the next day or so. And we will also be sharing a summary of the discussion on our blog, New Security Beat, and on Circle of Blues website in the coming weeks. Thanks for tuning in and thanks to all of you again for a great discussion.